the world is going to an end from the point of view of the moral decay that they find now. They call it moral decay, but to the modern boy or girl, it is um, life. But to us, it is not life at all. One should know where he or she is going. There should be uh, a sort of discipline. In the village, the father disciplines the child, or the mother disciplines the child. Here now, people say they take freedom from the white man, freedom that allows every boy or girl to do whatever he or she likes. We don't, we, we, people of my age don't like that. We, we believe that children are like strangers in this world. We come here before them. So we should show them where to go, where not to go, where danger is, where there's no danger. But to allow a stranger just to drift about in a new place is not very good. Ogundi's own childhood was a secure and happy one, and he has always kept contact with Ososa, his home. In the same way, too, he has always remained accessible, a man of the people. As he says himself, he had never had much of a formal education. He attended the village school up to standard six, the equivalent of finishing primary school in England. And I think I thank God today that I didn't go to that college or university at all, because um, I could have possibly been exposed to some classical way of life or some classical way of doing drama that I could not have been able to do what I'm doing today. His theater performs in either Yoruba or when he's outside the Yoruba speaking area, Pidgin English. I did for backyard. Listen, today is my working day. Yes, sir. Stand here. OK, sir. If you see anybody going like this, yes, sir. all like this, yes, sir. just break out. Stop. Okay, here, two of his actors rehearse Highway Eagle, the story of a roadside thief who, in this scene, instructs his new assistant. Then you go show and say you be man. You go be a blow. Oga, if I get a blow, bam. He say reply me, bam. What I go do? Then you go tell and say you be proper thief. Then you go come again and double blow. Take it again, Oga. West African pigeon is a language in its own right, and not just English badly spoken. Oga, that one you go finish him up. You go kill him, pata pata. Start here. Stop, proper. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Ah. Today. Oh, madam, good evening. How are you? Fine, madam. Well, well. Now, who are you? Oh, come on, madam. Come, now, come, come. Now, waiting. It be like, say, I know you somewhere. Me? Yes. Eh, where? Not be Jankara today. Jankara. Like Jankara. Not you, the same cloth. Oh, yeah, yeah, now yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, I know you. Oh. Sorry, oh, sorry, madam. Now mosquito, now Waiting mosquito. Waiting to bite somebody. Now mosquito. Now uh, so you plenty for them. There's plenty here. Now clothes are the sell for Jankara. Now clothes are the sell. Yes. Which one you want to buy? Now Ankara. Ankara. Lace. Lace. Damas. Anything you have. So you get money. I get money. Money yeah. for my pocket. Hey, what's in the phone oh, for my body? Oh, the mosquito. Sorry, oh. Ah, 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 sorry, oh. Ah, ah, sorry, oh. Ah, ah, sorry, oh. Ah, sorry, oh. Ah, sorry, oh. Ah, they go, ah, they go. go. OK, let's go. What is it? Who be this man? You be you. You know him? I don't know him. Who are you? They tell you so this place be Now This This place be your house? Go back, go back, go back. <laughs> Rehearsal of the police station scene in Highway Eagle. Why? Why? Look at you. Look Policemen you often turn up in Ogunde's place, not least because, after being a teacher for a short period, Ogunde became a policeman himself. I joined the police force by accident. I was on holidays from Ijebu, and I went to Ibadan. Then I was just going on the streets one day, and I saw a crowd of people, many people who were standing. Oh, I inquired, what were they doing there? They said um, policemen were being recruited. Oh, then I said, policemen, I like it. Then I joined the queue. Again? Go back again. About 10 minutes later, the superintendent of police came out and said, line up, line up, line up, line up. 
and we lined up. We were about over 400 of us on look parade. And so on, the, the superintendent it, came round, looked right. round, and then picked 40 of us out of 400. Then we sat to an examination, and four of us were selected. That was how I joined the police force. While in the police, Ogundi started to write religious operas and plays for various churches. He became much in demand, and in 1945 decided to turn professional. The whole money I got when I was starting was um, nine pounds. That was my saving for eight years in the police force. So I, out of these nine pounds, I bought raffia, bought drums, bought a small bicycle for one pound ten, and some costumes, and I started. He put out an advert in the uh, press asking for 30 charming ladies as actresses. 30. Can you imagine a, a new theater asking for 30 women? And uh, he got no response whatsoever. Then I put in another advertisement, uh, wanted. 30 lady clerks as um, workers, Ogunde, what was it then, African Music Research Party. And then the response was tremendous. Many people came, many girls came, even boys came. When they arrived for uh, interviews, he then told them that he wanted them for, uh, you know, as actresses, so that most of them ran away. And uh, some were removed by irated parents who didn't want their girls appearing on the stage and being considered as prostitutes, which they were in those days, not so much now. Yeah. Ogunde in the recording studio in Lagos, laying down tracks for his latest single. The tenor drum. The tenor drum. Yeah, louder. Bit, yeah, louder, louder, yeah. Ogunde's theatre has prospered since those early days in the 40s, and others have followed this path. Most of them, like Ogunde, have been writer-actor managers, giants in their own right. Men like the late Kola Ogumola, the late Duru Ladipo, Moses Olaya, and Oyin Adejobi. Forty years ago, there was no professional theatre in Nigeria in the strict sense of the word. Today, there are over 30 struggling traveling companies in just the Yoruba-speaking area of Nigeria alone. During those years, Ogunde's own company has constantly adapted and changed its style and subject matter. In the late 40s, for instance, the young Ogunde was influenced by the nationalism of such men as Dr. Namdi Azikwe, later to be Nigeria's first president, and Chief of Afemi Awulawo. He started to write plays that reflected the new political awareness of his time. They were really created specifically to imbibe cultural pride into the Nigerian public. Cultural pride so that they would be conscious to realize that colonial rule was, uh, continuing colonial rule was not good. In fact, when he took his play Strike and Hunger to the tin mining town of Jos, the colonial authorities reacted. And when the play started, police came on the stage and scattered the uh, you know, uh, actors and actresses and scattered the audience and arrested Ogunde and a few of his artists as well. And of course, the nationalist press notified the whole country immediately with screeching headlines. It became a hot public debate for days. You know, their darling had been captured by these very cruel people, you know, by these colonial masters. <laughs> and this, of course, helped Ogunde immensely. Independence came in 1960. But Ogunde's clashes with the authorities didn't finish with the end of the colonial era. He continued to be critical of the new African rulers. In 64, he wrote a play called Yoruba Ronu, meaning Yoruba Think. Although set in ancient times, it was in fact a bitter comment on the then current struggle between two Nigerian politicians competing for power, Chief Obafemi Awulawo and his protege, Chief S.L. Akitola. They invited him to write a play for the inaug inauguration of the cultural arm of their party, and he agreed. 
And when he put on the play, they thought he was going to show a nice cultural show on Yoruba custom. And he started attacking them. It's stories of a king who, leaving his vice regent temporarily in charge of his court, travels throughout his kingdom. But the vice regent, having been given power, has no intention of giving it up. The king is taken captive, and corruption and poverty come to his land. His bewildered subjects are left to suffer. Eventually, the gods intervene, and the king is restored to his rightful place. The prime premier and the ministers realized that he was attacking them, and they all got up and walked out. And he continued with the play, and it was immensely enjoyed by the public and the audience. And a few days later, he was banned. This time, he did not go to press. It was the press that protested on his behalf. This banning order lasted right up to Nigeria's first military coup two years later. But before then, in the 50s, Ogunde had developed what was later to be called his concert party style. Again, he was responding to the people's changing mood. They wanted a theater that concentrated a lot on jazz and uh, Western variety, you know, shows. And he had been doing this in Ghana, having his women playing the saxophone and dressed in grass skirt and big hats and really shaking their you know, figure. Uh, it was a theater that really oozes, oozed with sex appeal, which was not so in his theater of the 40s. He put onto the stage a collection of contemporary rogues, bomber boys and good time girls, talking hip and local pigeon, reflecting the easygoing morals of the new city life. Hey, which business is the crack now? Hey, you mean me? No. Hey, I'm importer and exporter. Hey, I don't get beer, but I supply them beer. Yeah. Of course. That is ticket change. Ticket change. Hey, sign your name. But in the 60s, Ogunde changed direction again. The West was moving in fast. Nigerians wanted to remember and record the old ways before they were changed beyond recognition. So we return to Arukmin Tenia, written in 1964. The sad tale of the poor Efutajo, condemned to exile in the forest for having given birth to a stone. We take up the story many years later, when a strange young boy is found by the river and brought to the king's palace. Already, he has told them that his name is Uriadeki Ibe, meaning in Yoruba, the one born to be king. Shortly after, the king summons his people to the palace. 